we have seen the different units in the architecture of uh, cortex m3 right we have seen uh, what are the different components then the registers then the operation modes the bus interface then even the interrupt controller and debugging support right so next there are some things uh, we need to know along with that so one thing is how the stack is implemented or the stack memory operations so we know in cortex m3 or in case of any microcontroller or processor normally you know besides the normal software control stack push and pop the stack push and pop operations they are also carried out automatically when entering or exiting an exception or interrupt handler that means uh, when you write the instructions for push and pop obviously you know contents of whatever uh, the registers you are going to push you know they will be put into the stack and when you pop when you write pop you know contents of memory will be stored into the registers so that is software controlled thing that means you are writing the instructions push and pop but apart from that even when you do not give the instructions suppose you know uh, when you are going to execute some functions or subroutines or suppose you know you are uh, ex uh, entering an ex uh, exception handler or an interrupt handler in that case without writing the instructions automatically the contents of certain registers are pushed and after exiting those particular uh, function or when when you come to the main program from an interrupt handler uh, automatically you know the contents of uh, uh, you know registers will be restored using pop right so for this the instructions are not written by the programmer but the controller will automatically do it upon entering and exiting an exception or interrupt handler so in general what are the operations of stack you know stack operations are memory read or write operations right you are reading the memory or writing to a memory so when you are pushing you are actually writing into the memory from register you are writing into the memory when you are popping you are getting the contents of memory into the register you are reading it with the address specified by a stack pointer by an sp means stack pointer right so the starting address of the stack is indicated in the stack pointer the data in the registers is saved into the stack memory by push operation and they are restored to registers later by a pop operation and when we do this the stack pointer is automatically adjusted it is automatically adjusted so that uh, the multiple data push will not cause old stack data to be erased that means if you give a push after the previous push you know it will not be uh, stacked into the same memory location it will be stacked in a different memory location and what is that different memory location you know it is automatically adjusted i mean the stack pointer is automatically adjusted so that you know the data do not overlap so whenever you push you know this right whenever you push the contents of stack pointer is decremented by 4 because each location you know uh, ca can carry only 8 bits so for 32 bit data four locations are required so each memory location uh, i mean it carries only 8 bits so the stack pointer is decremented by 4 and then the contents are popped similarly when you pop you know the contents are first popped and then the stack pointer is incremented by 4 and that you know increment and decrement of stack pointer is done automatically so user or programmer will not write any instructions for that the function of the stack is to store the register contents in memory so that they can be restored later after a processing task is completed so for temporarily storing some data you are going to use the stack for normal users for each store that is for each push there must be a corresponding pop or read and the address of the pop operation should match that of the push operation that means if you are pushing certain registers one after the other r1 r2 r3 while popping you know the registers of the uh, the contents of the registers have to be restored in the same order that means whatever the contents of r1 r2 r3 were there the same content should be there in the same register otherwise uh, there will be a mismatch and this is taken care by the controller when push or pop instructions are used the sp is incremented or decremented automatically as we have said so let us take an example of you know you have right you are writing some main program in between there is a branch branch with link function one right so you are executing a function suppose you are executing certain function you know here before you are act see in the function we might be using some uh, registers like r0 r1 r2 right so since the values of the registers will change while you are executing the function they have to be first pushed into the stack that means you have to store them temporarily so you can use push r0 push r1 push r2 
then write some lines which will change the values of r0 r1 r2 then after the uh, you know the task you have to again pop those registers back pop r2 pop r1 pop, pop r0 because you have to pop in the reverse order you know the pop operation have to be reverse order because stack is last in first out right whatever you have pushed last that will be popping out first so r0 r2 is there at the top of the stack you know so you have to pop r2 first then r1 then r0 and at the end you know uh, branch with the link register lr stands for link register you know you go back to the address that is pointed by the link register so that you continue from the same point where you had branched up right so at the end you are going to get the same contents of r0 r1 r2 back into them right this is how you use push and pop while while uh, executing a function first push that do the function and then pop in the reverse order right so here you are popping and pushing multiple registers in cortex m3 you can use a single instruction to push and pop multiple registers uh, you know that is by using r0 to r2 r0 dash r2 you can do that so when program control returns to the main program the r0 to r2 contents are the same as before that is you know if it is x y z it will be the same as we can see notice the order of push and pop the post pop order must be the reverse of push so if it is r0 r1 r2 for push then for r for pop it should be r2 r1 r0 so these operations can be simplified thanks to push and pop instructions allowing multiple load and store in this case the ordering of a register pop is automatically reversed by the processor that means we can use r0 to r2 like this push r0 dash r2 means the registers r0 r1 r2 will be pushed then after doing certain tasks which could change the values of r0 r1 r2 we can use pop r0 dash r2 so this instruction will actually pop r2 first r1 next and then r2 r0 right so it will automatically change the order i mean whatever the push order was there it will be a reverse of that right so this is the way you can use uh, push instruction for multiple load and store operations and then in cortex m3 we can also combine the return with the pop operation so uh, you know uh, what we have done in the previous case is we have pushed the registers r0 to r2 and then we have executed certain task and then we have popped the contents of those registers and then at the end of the function after executing the function we have branched to the main program by using dx lr so this will branch to the address pointed by the link register so what is the link register it will store the address of the next instruction to be executed after returning to the main program from the function right so you know you have used the uh, bl function one that is branch with link to function one that means after we return from the function you know it will uh, if you use bxlr it will again will be returning back to the same line from where you had branched so this you know you can combine this link or return with the pop so if you push the contents of link register along with the registers r0 to r2 and at the end when you are while you are popping the contents of link register if you are popping into the program counter it will do the same thing so you can avoid this particular instruction bxlr so what the program counter or pc will hold is the address of the next instruction to be executed so the link register will hold the address of the instruction that is immediately after the main program where you are branching uh, immediately after the instruction in the main program where you are branching and at the end when you are popping the contents of the link register into the program counter uh, what you are going to do is the next instruction to be executed will be exactly the same line you know which had to be executed after the line from where you had branched right so thus by uh, pushing the link register and popping it to the program counter uh, you can actually combine the return with the push and pop operation so uh, this is how you know stack is implemented in cortex m3 the cortex m3 it uses a full descending stack operation model full descending stack in the sense whenever you push new contents into the stack it will be stored into the lower address the stack pointer that is sp it points to the last data that is pushed to the stack memory and the sp decrements before a new push operation so you know this whenever you push something into the stack the contents of the stack pointer is decremented by 4 because each uh, data you know it, it will be 32, 32 bit wide and each location is 8 bit wide so it will take 
uh, four locations for 32 bit data. So whenever you push something onto the stack, the contents of the stack pointer is decremented by four. And when you pop, the contents of the stack pointer is incremented by four. That means the newer content, when you push into the stack, it will be stored at a lower address, right? So suppose you want to push the contents of this register R0 into the stack. Suppose the stack pointer is pointing to this particular location. This is the last push data. That is where the stack pointer is pointing. When you push the new contents into the stack, stack pointer is first decremented by four. Each location will have eight bits. That is uh, one byte of data. So for 32 bit data, it will require four memory locations. So it is decremented by four. So new stack pointer will be pointing to this particular address. And there the contents of R0 will be copied. Right. So this is the way stack will grow. Stack is full descending. It will grow downwards. Whereas here, you know, this is here. The memory is increasing. Memory address is higher above, whereas the stack grows downward. Similarly, for the pop operation, the data is read from the memory location that is pointed by the stack pointer first, and then the stack pointer is incremented. For example, in the previous case, you know, stack pointer is now pointing to this particular location. Now, if you pop to R0, you know, what happens is first the contents of this particular memory location is copied into R0, and then the stack pointer is incremented by four. Stack pointer will next be pointing to this particular address. So again, after that, if you push, you know, the contents will be copied into the same address that this data will be overwritten and the contents will be copied into the same address. The contents in the memory location are unchanged. When you just pop, it will make a copy of this memory location into the register, but this contents will remain as it is. But again, if you push something into the stack, this will be overwritten. So because each push or pop operation transfers four bytes of data, uh, that is each register contains one word. That means one word means in this case, it is 32 bits. That is four bytes. The stack pointer decrements or increments by four at a time. If it is push operation, it decrements by four. If it is pop operation, it increments by four or a multiple of four. Suppose you are uh, uh, more than one register you are pushing or popping, then you know it will be incremented by uh, four multiplied by how many registers you are pushing or popping. Suppose two registers you are pushing, then the contents of stack pointer is decremented by two into four, that is eight times. And while popping, it will be incremented by two into four, that is eight times. So in the Cortex M3, uh, R13, you have seen while discussing the registers, right? R13 is defined as the stack pointer. So whenever an interrupt takes place, a number of registers will be pushed automatically. The programmer need not write the push operation or the push instruction. And R13 will be used as the stack pointer for this stacking process. Similarly, the pushed registers will be restored or popped automatically when exiting an interrupt handler. And the stack pointer will also be adjusted. That means it will be incremented. So in Cortex M3, we have seen there is there are two stacks. There are two stack pointers, main stack pointer and process stack pointer. Cortex M3 has two stack pointers, main stack pointer and the process stack pointer. The SP register to be used is controlled by the control register bit one. This we have seen in the control register while discussing control register, right? There are two bits, control bit zero and control bit one. In that control bit one indicates which is the stack pointer used. If control bit one is zero, then we are using main stack pointer. If control bit one is one, then you are using process stack pointer, right? So if when control bit one is zero, the main stack pointer is used for both the modes, thread mode and handler mode, right? We are using main stack pointer for both modes, that is thread mode and handler mode. Uh, in this arrangement, the main program and exception handler, they share the same stack memory region. That means they'll be in the main stack pointer itself. It, it is point. It is It is the. They share the main stack itself. That is same stack memory region. This is the default setting after power up. After power up, by default, we'll be using main stack pointer for both thread mode and handler mode. Suppose you want to use process stack pointer for certain things, then you have to make this control bit one as one, right? Then you can do that. So by default, you know, control bit one, it will be zero. Then both thread level and handlers, they use the main stack. See, suppose, you know, initially you'll be in the thread mode using main stack pointer. Suppose interrupt happens, that will be in the handler mode. That will also be using main stack pointer. After exiting that interrupt service routine, you know, the unstacking happens. Then you're, again, you are using thread mode by using main stack pointer. So, you know, while uh, serving an interrupt, you are going to stack. And while exiting that interrupt service routine, you are going to unstack. 
right? See, in this, in both the modes, you know, in thread mode as well as in handle mode, here you are using main stack pointer itself. That means this happens when control bit one is zero. When control bit one is one, the process stack pointer is used in thread mode. Whereas for handler mode, it is always main stack pointer. So in this arrangement, the main program and exception handler can have separate stack memory regions. For main program, it will be the pointed by main stack pointer. Oh, sorry, main program will be in thread mode. It will be by the uh, process stack pointer. And for exception handler, it will be in for exception handler, it will be in handler mode. So it will be pointed by MSP, that is main stack pointer. So this can prevent a stack error in a user application from damaging the stack used by the OS. You know, you can separate the stack used by the user application and the stack used by the OS. The automatic stacking and unstacking mechanism will use PSP, whereas stack operations inside the handler will use the MSP. See, the thread mode, main program will be in thread mode that is using PSP. So when you're going to, when an exception or interrupt happens, it will go to the handler mode, it will be, it will be in MSP, right? So not only the mode, but also the stack pointer changes from PSP to MSP. Again, while exiting that interrupt, it will come back to the thread mode, which is uh, using PSP. Right. So this happens when control bit one is one. Uh, that means you are using two different stack pointers. Uh, that is MSP are uh, switching between MSP and PSP. So it is possible to perform the read or write operations directly to the MSP and PSP without any confusion of which R13 you are referring to. Right. So provided that you are in privileged level, you can access MSP and PSP using certain uh, instructions. We have seen this while discussing special registers. Right. Uh, X, this same instruction, they are used to access the special registers uh, using C language. They can be also used to access these stack pointers. X is equal to underscore underscore get MSP means you're reading the value of MSP into this variable X. If you want to change the value of MSP, you know, you can write underscore underscore set underscore MSP and whatever value you want to put into this MSP, you can write it. Similarly for PSP, you can do. So in general, it is not recommended to change the current selected SP values in the C as the stack memory could be used for storing local variables. So it is not recommended to do that in the C function. Uh, to access the S stack pointers in assembly, we can use the instructions that you use for special registers, that is MRS and MSR. MRS is, you know, move the contents of stack pointer into R0 or any register that you have. MRS, R0, MSP. It will co copy the contents of M MSP into R0. Similarly, if you want to copy the contents of R0 into MSP, you can write MSR, MSP, R0. Similarly, for PSP, MRS, R0, PSP will copy the contents of PSP into R0. MSR, PSP, R0 will copy the contents of R0 into PSP. By reading the PSP value using an MRS instruction like this, the OS can read data stacked by the user application, such as register contents before SVC. You get the data stacked by the user application, you know, uh, by using MRS R0 comma PSP. In addition, the OS can change the PSP pointer value by, for, for example, during the context switching in multitasking systems, it can change the PSP pointer value by using this. MSR PSP comma R0 will copy the contents of R0 into PSP. That means you are changing the stack pointers value, right? So that's how the two stack model you have, that is main stack pointer and process stack pointer. If got control bit one is zero, then main stack pointer is used for both thread mode and handle mode. And when the control bit one is one, we will use PSP, the process stack pointer for thread mode and MSP, that is main stack pointer for the handler mode. Next, we will see what happens when you reset the processor, that is the reset sequence. So after the processor exits reset, that is when you reset the processor or controller, it will first read two words from memory. So we have seen memory map at the lowest part of the memory map, I mean, at the first initial address, that is 0x000000, that you will have the starting value of R13, that is the stack pointer. So that will be read. And then at the next memory location, that is 00000004, that is the next memory location, you have the reset vector. The reset vector will hold the starting address of the program execution, right? It will hold the starting address of the program execution, that is from what should begin when you reset? So its address will be there in the reset vector. That will be written. The LSB of this should always be one because it indicates it is 
thumb state. You know, uh, cortex M3, it are, always operates in thumb two state. That is, there is no arm state. So LSB indicates the state. If it is zero, it is arm state. If it is one, it is the thumb state. So the reset vectors value or the contents should always, LSB of that should always be one to indicate the thumb state. If it is zero, it will cause an exception, right? So initially it will fetch the initial stack pointer value and then it will fetch the reset vector, right? So from there, you know, whatever address is there in the reset vector, that will start executing. I mean, the instructions are fetched from there and that will continue the normal sequence of operation. Because the stack operation in the cortex M3 is a full descending stack, that is, stack pointer is decremented before storing, or the newer, uh, newly pushed data will be stored at a lower address. The initial SP value should be set to the first memory after the top of the stack region. That means, uh, suppose you have a stack memory region, okay, in this particular case, this is a stack memory that is from, for example, if the stack memory range is from 0x2000 7c00 to 2000 that is 1 kb of uh, memory, if it is result for stack from 7c00 to 7fff, here we can see the address is 7ffc, that is because, you know, it is the starting address, it is, it is pointing to 4 bytes, that is 7ffc, 7ffd, 7ffe and 7fff, right, because it is 32 bit data. So this is result for stack. Then the stack pointer should be one more than that. That means uh, one location ahead. So that means if it is up to 2000 one more than that is 2000 right? So then when you push something into the stack, this value will be decremented by four, which will point to 7ffc and the first stacked item will be stored at that location. Again, if you push, it will be stored in this location. So that way it will be continuously storing in the lower memory locations. So, and after this 7C00, again, if you are pushing the contents, it will go back to, again, the starting address, right? So that way the stack is growing uh, downwards. And coming to the uh, reset vector, the vector table, it starts after the initial SP value. So whatever you have after this SP value, that's the vector table. Vector table, you have seen while studying the exceptions and interrupts, right? Vector table. The first vector is the reset vector. First, whatever you have is the reset vector because that has got the highest priority among all the exceptions, right? So in the cortex M3, the vector addresses in the vector table should have the LSB set to one, as we have uh, said previously. That is to indicate that they are in the thumb state, that they are thumb port. For that reason, uh, here you can see the contents of this reset vector is 0x00000101. But actually, it will point to 00000100. So it is pointing to 100, but you cannot write 100 here because if LSB is 0, it will go into an exception. So you have to make that LSB deliberately 1 and write 0x00000101. So this will mean that the uh, boot code is at 100 right so whatever you have the address here in the reset vector so from there the instruction execution will start that is first boot code will be executed and then normal operations will continue so uh, you know that yeah, that's what the previous example has 0x01 uh, 0x101 in the reset vector whereas the boot code it starts at address 100 so after the reset vector is fetched the cortex m3 can then start to execute the program from the reset vector address and begin normal operations so it is necessary to have the SP initialized. So before actually resetting, we have first initialized the stack pointer because some of the exceptions like NMI, non-maskable interrupt can happen right after reset. So the stack pointer has to be initialized, right? And the stack memory could be required for handler of those exceptions. So even before uh, reset vector, we are initializing the stack pointer. This is about that uh, reset sequence. And then there are some characteristics of on Cortex M3, like low power and high energy efficiency, we have seen this, right? The Cortex M3 processor is designed with various features to allow designers to develop low power and high energy efficient products. It has got different modes for low power utilization, like sleep mode and deep sleep mode, uh, which can work with various system design method methodologies to reduce power consumption during idle period. Its low gate count and design techniques reduce the cir circuit activities. There are lesser uh, gate counts Therefore, you know, it allows active power to be reduced. If lesser devices are turned on, you know, the power utilized is less. So it has high code density because you're mixing 16-bit and 32-bit codes, and hence it has lowered the program size requirement. 
it also allows processing tasks to be completed in a short time so that the processor can return to sleepers as soon as possible to cut down the energy use. Starting from the newer revision, that is Cortex M3 Revision 2, a new feature is available that is called Wake Up Interrupt Controller, which allows the whole processor code to be powered down while the processor states are retained. And the processor can be returned to active state almost immediately when an interrupt takes place. Right? It will be in sleep mode. When an interrupt happens, it will wake up. That's why it's called Wake Up Interrupt Controller. So this makes the Cortex M3 even more suitable for many ultra low power applications. So then uh, we will summarize the different characteristics that we have already seen. One of the important characteristics is the high performance. The Cortex M3 delivers high performance in microcontroller products. Uh, there are different features which support this high performance. Like many instructions are single cycle instructions. There are separate data and instruction buses. There is no state switching overhead because it always runs in the thumb. It always runs in the thumb state. Right? Then the thumb to instruction set provides extra flexibility in programming. Uh, that is, you can mix the thumb and arm instructions. Then uh, that is, you know, 16 and 32 bit instructions. Then instruction fetches are 32 bits and it operates at a higher clock, higher clock frequency that is over 100 megahertz. Then another characteristic is its advanced interrupt handling features. You know, there is built in NVIC that is nested vector interrupt controller, which supports up to 240 external interrupt inputs. It reduces the interrupt handling latency. Uh, interrupt arrangement is extremely flexible and the priority can be changed. A minimum of eight levels of priority are supported and priority can be changed dynamically. Some of the multi-cycle operations are also interruptible. That means if certain operation takes more than one clock cycle. Even we can interrupt in between them. Immediate execution of NMI handler is guaranteed on receipt of non-maskable interrupt request. So there is no latency if a non-maskable interrupt happens. So it will be executed immediately. Then another characteristic is its low power consumption. The Cortex M3 processor, it's suitable for uh, various low power applications. It is suitable for low power designs because of the low gate count. Now it has power saving mode support like sleeping and sleep deep, that is sleep mode and deep sleep mode. The processor can enter sleep mode using uh, WFI or WFE instructions, that is wait for interrupt or wait for exceptions, you know, or wait for event uh, instructions. The design has separated clocks for essential blocks or uh, so clocking circuits for most parts of the processor can be stopped during sleep. The fully static synchronous synthesizable design makes the processor easy to be manufactured using any low power or standard semiconductor process technology. So this low power consumption is very important because this Cortex M3 is mostly used for microcontroller based products which are most of the times battery operated. That's why, you know, lesser power has to be uh, utilized. So it is always better if it consumes as less power as possible. Then other characteristics are the system features. The Cortex M3 processor provides uh, various system features, making it suitable for a large number of applications. The system provides bit band operation. That is, there is a region in the memory that, you know, you can operate on individual bits byte invariant big and n mode and unaligned data access support advanced fault handling features include uh, various exception types and fault status registers making it easier to locate the problems that is in the debugging things with the shadowed stack pointer that is there are two stack pointers main stack and process stack pointer stack memory of kernel and user processes can be isolated so that you know problems in uh, user applications do not cause problems in the kernel level with the optional MPU, that is memory protection unit, the processor is more than sufficient to develop robust software and reliable products, right? So you can make or you can restrict the access to certain parts of the memory and thereby, you know, uh, you can protect and make the software robust and reliable. Then you have the debug supports. The Cortex M3 includes comprehensive debug features to help software developers design their products. It supports JTAG or serial wire debug interfaces. Uh, then based on the core site debugging solution, the architecture for debugging is the core site architecture. We have seen that, right? The processor status of memory contents can be accessed even when the core is running. Then it has built-in supports for breakpoints as well as watch points. There are six breakpoints and four watch points which are supported. Then optional ETM is used for instruction trace and data trace using DWT, that is data watch point and trace, right? New debugging features, including fault status registers, new fault exceptions, and flash patch operations uh, are there, which make debugging much easier. 
Then another unit called ITM, Instrumentation Trace and Microcell, it provides an easy to use method to output debug information from the test code. Then there is a PC sampler and counters inside the DWT, which provide code profiling information. So these are some of the characteristics which we have summarized. So with this, we have actually completed the first module, that is module one, that is ARM Cortex M3 or ARM 32-bit microcontroller. So we will just uh, revise what we have seen. We have seen the basics of what is ARM, what is ARM Cortex M3 microprocessor, its background, the different versions of architecture, then how it has evolved, the Cortex series, Cortex A, Cortex R, Cortex M, and evolution of ARM process architectures, then instruction set development, the thumb to instruction set or thumb to technology, what it means, and the applications and advantages of Cortex M3. And then we have come to the architecture. In that we have seen the different parts in the architecture and the features of that registers, special registers, how the special registers are accessed, right? What are the different registers? What are the different special registers and how they are accessed? Then we have also seen the operation modes, right? And privilege levels, state switching between different states, then memory map bus interface, memory protection unit, interrupt controller, nested vector interrupt controller, interrupts and exceptions and vector tables, right? The instruction set, you also see in the debugging support, that is different components used for debugging. Then stack memory operations. Today we have seen stack memory operations. What are the basic operations of stack? How stack is implemented in Cortex M3? What is the two stack model in the Cortex M3? And then at the end we have seen what happens when you reset the processor. Right. And later we have summarized the different characteristics. And with that, we have completed this module one, that is ARM 32-bit microcontroller. In the next class, we will begin the module two, that is the remaining module. Uh, in that, we will see ARM Cortex M3 instruction set and programming. How to, what are the different instructions? And we will see certain examples of programming in assembly as well as in embedded C.